it's appeared to be so good um, that we don't really care too much about the other problems. Um, I, uh, I've done other system call interfaces in the past as well, and one I was really proud of back in the day was Splice. And I think it, it was really cool. It still is really cool, but it never ended up getting any sort of adoption or traction. So it was really important to me that if we did go this route with IOU ring, um, that uh, adoption was a very important criteria for me. So uh, deep down uh, somewhere, maybe he does love it. And he hasn't been complaining about it since, even when I, um, and I probably shouldn't say this on video, but I've been sneaking in some features late in this merge cycle and I still <clears throat> have one left. Um, so we'll, we'll see if he still loves it. Uh, so what is IOU ring? Well, very fundamentally, it's just a communication channel. Um, and there's two uh, parts to this communication channel. There's a submission side and a completion side. And they're totally separate in terms of, of memory cache line utilization. So an application can be submitting and reaping completion, or a kernel can be producing completions at the same time, and you're not going to get any sort of cross traffic. This cross traffic is, is usually what kills interfaces, like, which is why AIO doesn't scale very well. Um, and for each of these queues, we have entries on those queues. So on the submission queue side, we have the IOU ring SQE for submission queue entry. And on the completion side, we have the IOU ring CQE. Um, so the application will produce these SQE entries and the uh, completion side on the kernel will produce the CQEs. All the data is shared between the kernel and application. So that means um, the actual ring buffers, the uh, submission and completion queue entries, all that is in shared memory. And we use some memory ordering tricks and uh, barriers to ensure that that's uh, safe to do. So that means for sub both submitting and completing I.O., we're not doing any uh, sort of copying at all. Um, I aim for it to be easy to use while powerful and hard to misuse, right? Any sort of API should have that. And whether I succeeded with that is probably doubtful, and um, I'll be interested in what you guys think after I go all these slides. Um, but most importantly, I want to be flexible and extendable. This isn't a block I.O. interface. It's an I.O. interface. So we should be able to do any sort of thing with it. So basic I.O., but also I.O. types that are coming down the line. So if we go through what the I.O.U. ring looks like and how you set it up and submit I.O., the first system call you run into is I.O.U. ring setup. Uh, it takes uh, an, an n entries parameter that actually is the Q depth of, of the ring, and you provide a, a param structure as well. And you can see that down here below. So basically, um, some of these are input and output parameters in the params. Um, you pass in the number of entries, and you get back what the kernel actually allocated, um, CQ entries and SQ entries. Um, you, get, uh, you can pass in some flags that will modify um, how the ring is set up. Um, learn from past experience, you know, always add flags to system calls. And there's some other parameters that we'll touch on a little bit later. Um, at the very bottom are two important parts that are output structures that describe how the application will get access to these rings. If we look inside one of those, so this is for the SQ ring. So the kernel tells us that the offset for the individual elements in, this, in submission queue ring, um, for the head of the tail of the ring, I think those are self-explanatory the ring mask and the ring entries, uh, flags that the ring might want to tell you about, um, the number of entries that were dropped, and um, finally, uh, an array, which um, should be an array, but it's not, so there's a typo there, but that holds the submission queue uh, entry indexes that you wish to submit. And a couple of reserve fields for, you know, for future use. So the IU ring once set up actually returns a file descriptor to you. Uh, everything in Unix or in Linux is, you know, is a file descriptor. So to get access to the rings, you memory map this file descriptor. You pass in a couple of different offsets depending on what you want to map. So to get complete access to the ring, you will want to map the submission queue ring, the completion queue ring, and the SQEs. Uh, these are separate, and I'll go into a little detail on that uh, later. But basically, just a normal memory map uh, function call. That pointer you get back, you add the offsets to that you were passed back in the previous slide, and then you dereference those, and then you get access to these uh, indices. So for reading and writing uh, the rings, so the indices, the head and the tail, are actually free running in IU ring. That means we never mask those. We just allow uh, in integer wraps of them at the end. Um, so to be able to index a specific tail or, uh, head or tail entry, you always mask it with the ring mask. Um, application will produce the submission queue entries. Uh, once it does that, it'll update the tail and, and kernel consumes that head. I think everybody who does rings do things a little differently, but that's how it works now you ring. So you'll update the tail, that's the producer, and the consumer will uh, consume the head. 
uh, the array will hold the index into the SQEs. So we map the submission queue, and then we map the submission queue entries as well. And when you submit new I.O., you, you grab an, an index from that and put it into these array and submit it. Um, this is done to have flexibility. So um, for some applications, you have uh, I.O. units, for instance, that need to dereference specific uh, ones. So we got more flexibility by doing it this way. For the CQ ring entries, it's a little different. Those are just uh, sequentially produced and consumed always. But um, likewise with the SQ ring, the kernel will update the tail when it adds new entries, and the app will consume at the head. So this is what the submission queue entries look like. I cut out a little bit of this, but it's a 64-byte um, structure. So it fits in a cache line, which is nice. But it's got basic information like an opcode. So that mean uh, be, is it a reader, write a request? Is it an F-sync? You know, what is it? I'll go into some of the supported types we have a, bit, a little bit later. There's some flags that modify how this thing, um, how that uh, modifies that particular opcode. Uh, IO priority, and then there's a file descriptor they want to do IO on, an offset for that file, a pointer uh, address, either to a buffer or an IOVEC, depends on what sort of opcode you're running if you uh, use either a buffer or an IOVEC, and finally a length field. And then we have a union of, of, I called it here miscellaneous flags, but really every opcode has an entry in this union. So there's a read-write flags, there's an f-sync flags, there's flags for all these specific ones. And some of them are used and some of them are not. Um, we'll see some of that later too. And then at the very end, you have a user data field. So this is used to, when you get a completion back, that completion will contain this user data, user data field as well. So you're able to match up a, a completion with a specific piece of I.O. you submitted. So here's a little example of what you would do when you need to get a new SQE to perform some I.O. Um, so basically first, we'll read the tail and uh, see if we add one to the tail, if that's equal to the head, you know, the ring is full, we can't. Uh, if it's not, then we can just index um, our SQEs. And um, once we have that, we just fill it in. And then once we've filled it in, we want to tell the kernel about it. So we fill in the index of the array and we do a write barrier, and then we update the tail and we do another write barrier. The reason why we do two is that once you've filled in the SQE, you want to ensure that all that the application will see uh, that part of it if it uh, sees the updated tail pointer. CQEs are much simpler. Um, first field is the user data that you submitted at I.O. time. Uh, and then there's a res field, which is basically just a return from the operation. So similar to if you did a read on a file descriptor and it turns 4K, it'll be 4K in there, or a negative error value. And finally, flags, um, which are not used. Uh, used to be used in the um, initial version that I had, an IOU ring will pass back to the application if a particular read was a cache hit. Um, but apparently there's some side channel side, effect, side effects from that. So um, I removed that um, before merging it upstream. And likewise, real quick, uh, finding a completed uh, submission queue entry is basically the opposite. You know, you know ring at the head, barrier is a little different, um, but that's what that looks like. So once you've filled in SQEs, you want to tell the kernel about them and submit them. And for that, that's where we enter the uh, second system call, IOU ring enter. So with that, you pass in the, the ring FD that was returned from IOU ring setup, and you tell the kernel, how many IOs you have to submit and how many you wish to wait for to complete. And then you have some flags that you can pass in and you have a six set as well. Um, the flags are, there are only two flags right now. And one of them is uh, IO ring uh, enter get events, which means, you know, wait for events as well, in which case it won't return until min complete events is complete as well. And one is an SQ wake up field that I'll, um, that I'll, I'll uh, get into a little bit later. So the important thing about this is that it allows an async interface to actually s both submit and complete in a single system call. Um, the IOU ring enter is non-blocking and requests can be handled in line. What that means is if you're doing buffered IO and doing a read, the last thing you want to do is submit that particular read, uh, have it be done by some other context and then complete. If we can do it in line and pass in both one to complete and one to uh, submit at the same time, then we have the same performance that synchronous interfaces have, which is a pretty rare thing for async uh, I.O. Quick overview of the op codes that are currently supported for I.O. Uring. Uh, NOP is pretty self-explanatory. It just produces a completion queue entry uh, upon entry to the kernel. I used to benchmark the interface so we can see what sort of throughput we can get through. 
uh, read V and uh, write V or vector uh, read and write operations. We have an F sync, uh, similar to one in AIO. Then we have read fixed and write fixed, uh, which are versions of read V and write V. I'll get into those a little bit later too. Uh, we have got support for poll, so you can do uh, poll file descriptors through this or sockets. We have a sync file range uh, version as well, so you can uh, sync, uh, do that in async fashion. And send message, receive message, to be able to do some basic network I.O. And finally, a timeout command. I actually just added that to the slide yesterday since um, it got merged a couple of days ago, so that one's really fresh. Now uh, we get back to this, because I can tell a lot of you don't think this seems very easy to use. Um, as you know, there are only two hard problems, computer science, cast and validation, memory ordering, and off by one errors. And we have a lot of those, um, all of those. So this is where we get to liburing. So liburing is um, similar to how AIO has libAIO, which doesn't actually contain any uh, interesting code. Liburing provides a more simplified interface on top of IOUring. Um, and it's got one example is helpers for setup. So here's an example of just part, you know, memory mapping the rings and, and getting mapped in with the offsets and what, whatnot. That's what it what looks like without IOU ring. And uh, for IOU ring, you just do this. You just declare the ring and you call Q in it and you're done. And similarly, there's, you know, help us for submitting IO. You probably remember, this is roughly the example I had earlier, you know, get the new tail, figure all these things out. For liburing, it just looks like this. Um, so basically, that one line, IOUring get SQE, that's all the entire previous page. Um, I've got some other examples on here too, how you fill in the IO vec. Um, there's some various prep functions that help prepare this SQE for the specific operation. Then you can do an IOUring submit, that'll tell the kernel about it. And you can do an IOUring wait CQE, which blocks in the kernel if it has to, if the event isn't available. And finally, you read the CQE and you tell liburing that you've, you're not done reading with the CQE. The reason why that's two operations is because we don't want to update the indices in the CQ ring before we actually read the data, or you could potentially wrap around and it could get reused. So liburing, I think, is pretty nice. It provides a, a fairly simple interface. Uh, it eliminates the, new, uh, the need for manual memory barriers, uh, deep understanding of memory ordering and read and write barriers and all that stuff. Um, you can mix and match easily. You can use just the ring setup, for instance. If you still want to use the raw interface, that's totally fine, or you know, vice versa, though I don't know why anyone would ever do that. Um, the Libby ring package contains kernel headers as well, so you don't need to have updated kernel. Um, it contains everything you need. So I would just say, you know, use it. Don't try and be a hero. Use the raw interface. I don't think there's a really good reason for it when we can condense it down to something that's much more simple. And that's the resource for liburing. Um, if you want to clone it and make it, so it also mentioned that all the every time I found a bug or a regression or a crash in in the IOU ring, I've added test cases to libu ring. So there'll be if you make run test in there, it'll go through and, and run all these regression tests. And uh, it's been really handy for merging new features or changes. Now it gives me a, a certain level of confidence that things actually work. Still. Uh, just a quick overview of the IU ring uh, stuff. There's a queue in it, queue exit. Given that the IU ring is actually a file descriptor, the application when it exits doesn't have to call queue exit. The file descriptor will be closed, and on the final close of it, um, it'll it'll free the IOU ring. Then there's various prep helpers for the various uh, commands that we have, so you don't need to uh, understand all the fields. And we've got the submit, submit and wait is a U ring helper, live U ring helper that'll. Um, do the submit and complete in a single system call if you can. And then, as we saw in the previous slide, there's the IOU ring wait CQE to wait for completion entries. There's also a peak version that'll just tell you if you currently have entries sitting in the CQE ring. And then there's uh, CQE scene. And finally, there's helpers to get and set the data that's passed back from submission to completion. So one, the set will operate on the SQE, and the get will operate on the CQE. So some of the more advanced uh, features, one of them is uh, a drain flag. Um, so if you set this in the SQE flags, uh, it tells IOU ring that you want to wait for uh, previously submitted IO to complete uh, before you um, do this one. So one example of that would be issuing a bunch of writes, for instance, and then um, queuing an uh, and F-sync with the uh, drain flag set. That'll ensure that any uh, pending write or any other IO in the U ring will complete uh, before it does the actual sync. There's a somewhat related feature flag to that that's called linked commands. Um, so 
whereas the drain flag is set on any SQE when you submit it, the, the link flag allows you to submit arbitrary long chains of SQEs. And every um, the IOU ring uh, code will continue to complete these uh, chains as long as the previous one succeeds. So if you do a bunch of, of uh, different commands and one of them fails, that'll abort the chain. You will get completion queue entries uh, uh, for the ones that didn't complete as well, just tell they've been canceled. And that's another reason, uh, another way you could do the write, 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 F sync thing. You just submit that as one big bundle. And then when you know when you get your completion event for the F sync, then all that's uh, complete. So the intent there is to eliminate some of the write bubbles you get in applications when you do a bunch of writes and then you have to do an F sync and you introduce much bigger bubbles in it. For here, you can just submit these and then you can go on with an, uh, other writes and F syncs. Another nifty thing you can do, and I actually wrote an example for this in LibUring. Uh, is you can do file copies just with single system calls. So you'll submit one SQE that's a read from a given file at a given position, size, et cetera, and then have a write that's linked to that. You know, so it's a different file, different position size, whatever. So that means you can copy chunks of data just using these um, single system calls and single entries. And I actually implemented that in Link CP. That's in liburing. I don't look too much at the error handling and whatnot. It's just a tech demo, I would say. And basically, you just set IO SQE, IO link, and the SQE. And you can continue setting that um, to define that chain. And the first SQE that will not have it set when you submit it will define the end of the chain. Um, it's really easy to use, and I think it's a very cool uh, construct, and it's got some very interesting things we can do with it in the future. Finally, uh, IO Uring register is the, f is the last part of the three system calls that is IO Uring. Um, there's a couple of different opcodes that this takes. Um, it'll register buffers, files, or event FD. And I'll tell you a little bit about each of them. So one thing you can do is register buffers. Um, when you do particularly direct, direct IO in Linux, for every uh, call when you go in and want to do IO, the kernel has to call a function called get user pages that'll map these user pages into the kernel so you can do a proper serial copy IO. And then when the IO completes, it has to release these pages again. So with the registered buffers in IU ring, you can actually give it a whole region or a set of regions of these buffers that you want to use for I.O. and have them uh, pre-mapped for you. So that means when you do I.O., you don't have to do the get user pages and you don't have to do the put pages when you're done with the I.O. And um, that alone actually eliminates about 100 nanoseconds um, from sync I.O. Do, uh, done in the kernel. And that might not seem like a lot, but in, in these days of you know DPDK and SPDK and other things, we want to squeeze every cycle we can out of the kernel. And this is where the, uh, the read fix and the write fix commands come in. So these are only uh, valid with these fixed buffers. Uh, they're not IOVEC based, even though you pass in an IOVEC to register these buffers. Um, the actual read commands, you just pass in the address of that buffer and you pass in the index of it. So when you set up these uh, read and write fix commands, uh, you just basically give it the buffer index and the actual buffer and the length. You don't have to do full length of buffers. It's perfectly valid to register, say, um, you know, one gigabyte region you want to do I.O. in and then just have a single I.O. command just be 4K with somewhere within that region. That works totally fine. For register files, works somewhat in the same way, at least the, the, uh, the premise is the same. We want to eliminate some parts of what makes the I.O. submit and completion path expensive. And for this one, it's the F get and F put. And these are atomic increments and decrements of the file count that we have to do for each I.O. So to register a set of files to be used with I.O. Uring, so you can use these fixed indices, um, you call I.O. Uring register, and, and you give it an array of integers, basically, in the length of that array. And I.O. Uring will go and open and pin all these files. And then when you go and submit I.O., you set the fixed file flag. And instead of using the actual file descriptor that you register it with I.O. Uring, you just use the index into the array. So in that sense, it's very similar to the registered buffers. And uh, there's actually an interesting uh, bug uh, that arose from that in some of the earlier submissions. And I sent this in with the register, uh, register file descriptors, and I thought it was pretty cool. And uh, Albiro says, you know, what happens if you take a socket and you register both ends of that socket with IOU ring, and then you pass the IOU ring FD through the socket? And obviously what would happen is IU ring would hold you know, two references to the socket. And once you pass the IU ring uh, through the socket, uh, the socket will hold a reference to the IU ring. And then you're you know, sort of screwed. It'll never be released. Um, so uh, thankfully, Al was very helpful in describing how we use the SAM uh, rights to 
uh, garbage collection for file descriptors to be able to solve this issue. And LWN actually wrote a really excellent article about it. Uh, if you're at all curious about BFS kind of stuff, it has a link to the email that Al sent me to re uh, as a reply, which is, um, I don't know how many pages of just raw Al brain dump. It is, uh, it is worth a read. Finally, the last thing you can register is an event if the um, this was mostly done since Lib LibAIO has similar support, and some applications depend on having an event FD that, that they can pull on that gets signaled when uh, I/O completes. Uh, very basic, so you just pass in the single event FD descriptor you have. Uh, we ignore the number arcs since it's just one, and it allows you to get completion notifications through event FD should you wish to do so. So one of the new features uh, we added for I.O. Ruing is pulled I.O. So we actually already have this through the pread v2 system call. There is a flag called hypry. And what that does, it allows you to pull for I.O. So again, um, there's some overloading of, of names here. It's not the pull to system call. It's basically the, uh, the Linux equivalent of are we there yet in terms of I.O. So instead of using an IRQ uh, from the hardware to tell you, oh, this IO is now done, you just keep going, you know, there it is, it's done, it's done, it's done, it's done. At some point it's like, yes, God damn it, it's done, go take it. So you trade a lot of CPUs it's for, for latency win. But it comes really interesting once you go really high up into the IOP scale. At some point, you have a crossover point where if your IRQ driven is actually uh, more CPU intensive than doing pole IO. Typically, at least on modern systems, on the cores, if you do uh, 600,000 IOPS plus or something like that, um, polled ends up being uh, more efficient. Um, it's absolutely necessary for low latency devices. There's just no way you can get into the, the realm of what Optane devices, for instance, can do today or the NVRAM uh, back devices um, with doing RQ. Uh, it adds easily three microseconds when you do IO and especially if you do synchronous kind of IO, uh, which the worst case you submit IO, you put the task to sleep and then you have to wait for the RQ. So there's some delay in that and then it has to wake up the task and then you're finally done. So polling uh, makes some of these much, uh, much better. So either low latency or very high IOPS, it's, it's definitely a win. To use that, you use the IOU ring setup IO poll flag. So you pass that in through the, the flags that I showed for registration. Submission side works exactly the same, right? You submit IO in the same sort of fashion you did before, um, and, but the reaping is polled. So the only difference will be, you will use the same, sign, same kind of interface, but instead of going to sleep waiting for events if it has to, the IOU ring will go and pull and wait for them. Um, so even though we do support this with pread v2, it's only sync version. For this, with IO Uring, you could potentially do you know, high Q-depth kind of, of polled I.O. It works fine with it. Only important thing is if you set up an IO Uring context for polled I.O., you cannot use it for non-polled I.O. And the reasons for that are a little complicated, but basically boils down to you don't know when you can safely wait uh, for I.O. events to come in or whether you need to be looking for them actively. So in, for efficiency reasons, that doesn't work. So raw BDEV support, uh, block device support is there uh, through NVMe, uh, both uh, local storage, but also NVMe over TCP. And it works uh, file systems as well through XFS, for instance. So you don't have to do uh, raw block di device IO. You can, you can do it through files as well, or file systems. Another efficiency uh, feature is pull submission. So basically everything that I said in the previous slide is true. The only difference here is that you will don't even have to enter the kernel to do IO. Um, so that means that when you uh, want to submit I.O., you just fill in the SQE entries and then the kernel will you know, magically see these new entries and submit them for you. Um, there's a couple parameters you can pass in with it. You can limit it to uh, specific CPUs in the system or specific CPU. And there's also a threat idle parameter, which basically tells the kernel that, um, you know, sit there, be busy looking for I.O. for this amount of time. If no I.O. shows up in, in that amount of time, then just go to sleep. And this is where the SQ ring flags comes in. So if that happens, the kernel will set this flag and Libu ring will know that when we submit I.O., we actually do have to enter the kernel for that specific case. So usually you would just have to update the, um, the tail pointer and the kernel would see it. But if the uh, neat wake up flag is set, then you'd have to go into the kernel and wake it up. So that uh, gives you a good uh, balance between, uh, as long as you keep the, the, the kernel busy with IO, then uh, this thread will notice them basically immediately. Uh, and if nothing happens for a while, then it'll go to sleep. Um, but that's this uh, with IRQ driven IO, this will allow you to do IO without doing a single system call, which I think is pretty nifty.
So that was just an overview of uh, IOU ring. And I figured I'd give some performance results as well, since otherwise it becomes a little technically boring, I think. Um, the very first simple example is just doing a no op. And um, IO, AIO does not support no ops, but it was like a five line thing to add this new op code. So I did and wrote a simple benchmark script just to do, you know, send no ops through this system. So the only thing this will do is it'll just submit n number of IOs at the time, that's the x axis down there, and then it'll wait for these to complete. And that gives you a good uh, picture of the flatlining of AIO at about 4 million IOPS, 4 or 3, something like that. Whereas IO ruing is, is much more efficient in uh, handling these very basic uh, kinds of commands. And you know, given that no ops isn't particularly interesting, here is doing actual IO as well. So this is a peak performance example of uh, running on, in this particular example, two devices. Since I didn't have one device, so we're able to um, uh, saturate a, a single core and IO ring. So this is just a single core in the system, not like the whole box itself, just a single core on my uh, seven-year-old test box. And we have the bottom graph, the blue ones, AIO. It's maxing out at about, I don't know, 430, I think. And you even see a tendency to some negative scaling at the end, which is always a worrying sign. Then the next one up is a IOU ring, but IOQ driven. And that tends to max out a core just shy of a million IOPS. And finally, we have the polled version of IOU ring. And with that, you can get pretty close to 1.6 million just with this basic setup uh, IOPS. So these are 4K IOPS on a single core. And since AIO doesn't have this, uh, I did some buffer performance. Since I think um, I'm all about the performance and optimization and then the interesting parts that are O direct, um, but I think the use cases for buffered AIO is so much bigger. Um, so here's a nice example of just reading a 16 gigabyt file twice. Uh, so the reason we do that is the you know once you read the first part of it um, randomly, then you know you get at the start of the test you'll just get raw media access, and as you progress through these you know, 2x the file size, you'll get more and more cache hits. So it shows both the raw performance of it, but also what happens when files are mostly cached. And um, so this simple test case, we can see how you ring finishing about seven seconds, and buffer or the sync uh, version takes about 15 seconds. So one, uh, like Jesper talked about with DPDK, uh, and one obvious reason why I did this was to compete with the SPDK, which is sort of the storage equivalent of, of DPDK. And um, if you look at the, the times that uh, libAIO takes to do IO, just for a sync um, piece of IO, you can see we use about 10 microseconds. This is on hardware where the actual read is probably about five microseconds. So the overhead from AIO is pretty substantial. Uh, if you look at the IU ring case, where you use also IRQs, we reduce a little bit, but it's really not that much. Uh, the other part dominate pretty quickly. Um, and then I have a couple of examples of using the uh, SQ thread. So that's the kernel pulled submission side of things. You know, For that, we don't have any submission latency at all, since we just have to wait for the completion once we put it in. That gets us down a little bit more. And uh, finally, we have IOU ring poll, uh, which takes us to about, I think it was 5,800 nanoseconds, so 5.8 microseconds to do IO. So if you sort of quanti uh, quantify how much time you're spending, it looks like on the uh, IOU ring side, we're spending about 120 nanoseconds doing completions. That's the whole stack. So that's through the block stack, through IO ring, everything. And on the submission side, we're using about 650 nanoseconds to do that. So there's still, comparing to SPDK, we're actually faster on the completion side, but the uh, submission side, we still have some work to do. So finally, some uh, adoption. I've had uh, actually a surprisingly uh, high amount of interest in, in this new API. Um, and the language side, Rust, and, and recently I talked to a guy who's doing some C++ standards work, and he's interested in using it for the IO executors. Uh, so that's pretty nifty. Um, Ceph is, is uh, I don't know if they've merged it yet, but if not, it's really close um, for their Blue Store new backend that they did. Um, LibUV, which is a very widely used library for things like uh, Node.js. Uh, well, I have uh, pending patches for it as well. I've been in touch with a Postgres guy who's been working on doing Postgres support for it. And that's actually been very helpful also in driving uh, some of the performance. Um, I mean, nothing's perfect and IOUing isn't perfect either, and especially as a new interface. 
for buffered, which is an entirely new uh, thing that we're doing. Um, there's been various issues that we've been working through, so that's been super helpful. And uh, RocksDB, I actually did um, did some results on RocksDB. And uh, I don't know if you've ever, ever read the RocksDB code base, and I, I don't want to offend anyone, but it's, you know, it's C++, and it's, um, it's, it's pretty nasty to read, I think. Um, but I went through and added support with uh, some guidance from some internal developers on RocksDB um, for an uh, interface part they have that's called multi-read. So multi-read is basically uh, you ask for a number of keys at the same uh, time. And Rox is, is buffered, at least in this test case. Um, and the way they currently have it implemented is they'll just iterate through uh, these keys they need to get and just read them serially. Um, so I added IO Uring support uh, for multi-read um, and ran some performance results with 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32 keys. And so we see for one key, performance is the same, which is the ideal uh, condition again. If you can get the same sort of sync performance out of an async API to account sync, then I think you're doing pretty good. And once you start adding more and more keys, um, the, the win over the sync interface just becomes very apparent. So you can see even at two keys, we've got a really nice win. And if you look at 16 keys, we stopped doing the sync stuff after that because there's just no point, I think, in going on. But we're getting some really nice wins out of that. Really, uh, another interesting one that actually came up on Twitter was this guy saying, hey, I'm working on this new uh, database thing. And uh, I got so excited when I saw IOU ring, I based the entire thing on just using the IOU ring interface. And I thought that was you know, pretty, uh, pretty nifty. And he recently sent this benchmark where he ran uh, his new database against MongoDB. Um, the test case is there, inserting, inserting 200 million keys uh, using just a single CPU and four gigs of RAM. And uh, not to have IOU ring take um, take the credit for, for this win, but it's nice to see somebody try and do some new cool stuff on top of new interfaces. So basically, in summary, MongoDB took 77 hours to complete, and this new uh, TYRDB took 38 minutes. A couple more results. Uh, we have a various, it might surprise you, but we've got a couple of different storage uh, things going on at Facebook, and one of them is called Big Cash. And, uh, I don't know why some of my numbers look really weird on the screen. But anyways, um, a guy internally implemented IU ring support uh, instead of AIO in, in uh, Big Cash and was able to take the queries per second from 1.7 million to 2.3. So that was a pretty nifty one. And then I also get these uh, sort of random ones that are just you know, thrown at me on Twitter. Uh, this person implemented a single threaded uh, benchmark for an echo server with uh, ePoll and IOU ring and saw some really nice wins. So I thought that was cool. And uh, finally, from uh, these are actually uh, test results from uh, Intel. Uh, and the summary uh, that came out of that with the slides they presented, and they're also going to present at the Flash Memory Summit about IO Uring uh, later this month, I think. Uh, basically, in summary, AIO, you're stuck with about 500K IOPS per core. And IO Uring, you can drive one, uh, one to two million per core. So again, I think the absolute numbers aren't maybe necessarily super interesting, but it just shows you the level of efficiency that we can do I.O. at, which I think is interesting. So finally, for future stuff, um, one of my big things that I want to work on is to be able to do any system call async with uh, I.O. Uring, uh, given that it's just a transport mechanism for commands. And if you recall from one of the previous slides, the SQ entry is 64 bytes. So that actually means we have, you know, if we take eight bytes, um, for a system call number, we're left with seven times eight bytes of data left, which is exactly the amount we need for if you've got a crazy system call with the maximum seven arguments. Um, and some of you that have been around for a long time may remember uh, Ingo Molnar from Red Hat posted syslet threadlet patches back maybe, I think, 12 years ago, which is a mechanism to do this sort of thing uh, that never went anywhere. But I think um, if we could resuscitate some of that stuff and bring it back, uh, we'd be able to do anything uh, with uh, IOU ring. I think it'd be super cool. You could do open, you know, read, close, or open, read, read, write stuff in a, in a linked set of commands with uh, IOU ring. So you can just basically link any sort of system all together in that, in that, in that way. Um, I had to put some BPS stuff up there. You know, it's all the rage. But you could also imagine cases where IOU ring, uh, where BPF is interfacing with IOU ring. It can either produce SQE entries or uh, consume and, and with link commands, you know, can help. You can implement a file server in the kernel that would never have to do any system calls, for instance. 
which would be kind of crazy, but you know, it could work. Uh, key value store is another thing that's uh, coming on the NVMe front, and basically drives having support for key uh, put and get sort of primitives. We could do that easily through IOU ring. Another uh, interesting thing would be able to do, we can now carry metadata for the command. If we have enough space, you could do end-to-end uh, -end integrity stuff without having to use private vendor interfaces. And of course, as always, you know, continued efficiency, uh, improvements and optimizations, things like this are, are never done. And um, I'm pretty excited to still be working on it, particularly because it's gaining a lot of community interest and I'm having you know, more and more contributors send in stuff that I think is, is really nifty. It makes it more fun. And finally, continue to improve documentation. In LibUring, there's man pages for the system calls, but not for the LibUring interface itself. So that would be nice to have. And finally, just some resources. Uh, I wrote a uh, sort of lengthy document on IUring, the design and all the features and whatnot. I would say that's uh, still the definitive guide to what it can do. I do update it. Whenever I add new features, I add them there eventually. Um, but that is worth a read if you're interested in it. And in terms of examples, uh, my FIO tool has, of course, an engine of IOU ring, so you can run an IO through it. It also has a very simple little benchmark application that you can use, and which is probably easier to study on itself. Just note that it doesn't use lib U ring. I should probably convert it to that since I'm preaching. Uh, everybody else should use it. Um, as mentioned, the man pages and the regression tests in LibUring, there's also examples, uh, so some basic use cases, uh, nothing really involved and interesting, but things like the link copy things, things that demonstrate some of the features that we can do. And uh, finally, I would also still refer to the original LWN article, which uh, I looked at the timing of that, and it was posted about a week after I posted the, um, the initial version of it. So the article is a little out of date, uh, but most of it is still uh, current. So. If in doubt, you know, refer to the definitive guide. But that's uh, about all what I had, and I'll take any questions if you have any. Uh, what's the, can you go a little bit into how ePoll and IOUring relate to each other? Um, they don't really relate to each other. I, do you think of anything in specific? I was wondering what use cases you could cover with IOUring that you currently have to do with ePoll, whether it provides performance benefits. Yeah, so you can use the, uh, let me go back here. So if you want to do polling of lots of file handles, I guess it's in here somewhere. Um, IOUing supports, um, there you go, uh, poll add and poll remove. So that'll allow you to poll on any number of, of massive file descriptors. Um, similar to what AIO also supports, which was added, I think, for SkillaDB or something like that that use it. Um, so if you're polling uh, on lots of sockets or file descriptors, you can do it very efficiently through IOU ring. You don't have to use the ePoll for that. Okay, that's exactly the kind of use case I have in mind. Okay, I think that's the Twitter example of the Echo server she okay. had, right? I just sitting and waiting on all these. You can also have link commands where you do a poll and then have a read after it. So you can get your read to auto-execute when, if you're polling for read, for instance, or receive message, something like that. <laughs> Down here first, I think. Okay, no, I, I want to ask my questions. Oh, we do? All right, I guess we're done. Um, just come find me after and we'll take any questions. <laughs>